Hi, my name is Tracy Tommy. I'm the President and CEO of the Dayton Society of Natural History. I have been here almost two years. Prior to COVID, we were really on a roll. Um, I had been here long enough to really have my arms wrapped around the different facets of everything that we do. We do have two locations, the Boonshoff Museum of Discovery and Sunwatch. And there's a lot happening amongst all of those with our zoo, our planetarium, our distance programming, everything that we have going on. So prior to COVID, we were really making great progress. We had just finished our strategic planning process through Aileron. We were implementing that plan. We were starting new revenue streams with making castings of our, some of our collection items, um, looking at traveling exhibits, bringing in some exhibits that we actually did in-house and with a little bit of outside resources as well. And that would include the White Allen Racetrack and the Ancient Egypt exhibit. So both of those had just opened. Our numbers were up, people were coming here. It was great. Schools were really requesting even more of our distance learning programs and our uh, exhibits to go programming. Um, we had added a couple new animals to our zoo. We had updated things, cleaned up a lot of areas. And really, the team was working great as a team at that time. I'm Dawn Kirchner, Vice President of Education here for the Dayton Society of Natural History. Essentially, I oversee everything that is education. So that's directly the Education Department, the Astronomy Department, and the Discovery Zoo here at the museum. A lot of what we do is in person with the public. So that may be general public programs where people come in visiting the museum and they engage in a hands-on science activity, encounter with an animal, they may be coming here with their school. So they may come into our lab or our science theater where I am right now to do a school-based program to support the curriculum. We may have scouts in to complete a badge workshop. We may have teachers here to do a program. And we may be holding a bigger community event such as our, our Dayton Science Festival that's typically held in the fall. We also do a lot of other free programs like our Super Science Saturday, where we open up our entire facility for free to really serve everybody in our community. The other components of what I do is to seek out grant funding to make sure that schools and, and children that may not necessarily be able to get here have that opportunity, perhaps in a summer camp experience that we hold June, July, and August or it may be going out into the community and helping to foster new community partnerships to help strengthen the missions of, of all those organizations really to better our entire community. My name is Taylor Hoffman and I am the site manager at Sunwatch and I am also the, the digital marketer for the Dayton Society of Natural History. So pre-COVID, I was responsible for taking over our social media and our website and kind of vamping up our online presence. So between Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I was working to build our content library and our engagement with the online community and kind of showcasing what we do between Boonshoft and Sunwatch. Um, it was a really exciting opportunity to kind of uh, build on what was already present, but make us raise more awareness and make it more exciting for our members and those in the community to kind of watch what we're doing here at the Dayton Society of Natural History because we have a lot going on and able to offer that sort of on a sort of free basis is a really neat experience. As soon as we heard and we were warned that we might be closing soon, we started immediately having conversations about what we would need to do. So the weekend that we closed would have been our second largest annual fundraiser, which is Eureka. We had to immediately talk to caterers, ticket purchasers, sponsors, and let them know that that event was just not going to happen. Um, we canceled that. We worked as a team to do that. We had such a strong team, and I can't emphasize that enough. It was really the communication levels that we had built between team members and across departments that really made it, um, I won't say not stressful, but as less stressful as it could be while we were trying to shut down and keep everyone safe. We have some of our team members who work in the zoo and facilities who really can't just stay home. They have to come in and take care of our animal collection, but we needed to stagger their hours to make sure that they were you know, socially distanced and also if someone did get sick, we can't lose our entire zoo team at the same time, so we had to make sure that they were really keeping separate. 
Um, this building holds around 1,500 people, and we were running somewhere around 6 to 10 here at a time and in very different areas. So all of that was really interesting to balance. Um, we also had, you know, the stress levels that we needed to consider and who could work at home and who needed to take care of family members and just allowing people to um, sort of process the situation and, and figure out the best place for how to support and help each other while continuing our mission. So the educational programming was taking place, social media popped in, um, you know, all of these things were happening and we're trying to figure out like, how will we survive this year and how long might this take? We didn't know, nobody knows, we still aren't sure. But, um, but our team was good and we kept a very positive, strong, forward-looking vision and remembering that strategic plan and where we're trying to go and just trying to do the best that we could to meet that. So as soon as we received the word that we would be closing down the following day based on stay-at-home orders, I had a quick discussion with some of my colleagues who were also working that day. It was a Saturday morning. And so Taylor, of course, was one of those individuals. And we talked a little bit about where are some of our strengths and where are some of our weaknesses online. And then I also talked with one of our other educators in the department about what are some of the strengths that we have. Of course, we've been doing digital programming for a number of years through distance learning, so we felt confident that we could carry that on. And we already had a number of programs that were written out that we could redevelop for pairing with some of those videos. So we very quickly decided on the Boonshoft at Home series, which would allow our educators to do science demonstrations that families could do at home by printing off some of those activities, as well as also promoting behind the scenes opportunities with our collections department, our planetarium department, and our zoo with live animals. So really it was a matter of how frequently do we want to do this, who else needs to be involved, and how do we get the word out. So very quickly the following day we did a short video commercial essentially, to explain to all of our visitors and other folks on Facebook what we were going to do to make this a little bit easier. The next day on Monday, we released three of those videos and we continued to do that for several weeks. As we got more comfortable with that process and it was looking a little more evident that live summer camps probably weren't going to happen, kids probably weren't gonna be going back to school, we decided how do we bring fun science activities to families over the summer? And that's where Camp in a Box was born. And so really in a matter of a week, I got all of our educators together. We came up with seven different themes and we moved forward with developing week long experiences along with the content and the materials all in one box. Of course, we couldn't do that by ourselves, so we brought in our guest services team to help us price out where to find some of these items. How would we package this? How would we ship this? And how would we do it in a very, very small compartmentalized way to make it very easy for families to actually get at home, open and make it exciting? Additionally, our CEO actually had a wonderful contact that she met in a local leadership group and this company actually works in promotions and apparel and they do shipping. So we were able to partner with this local company to help us ship, order supplies at a lower cost and really make this more effective. As summer started coming, coming closer and closer and we received word that we would be able to do in-person live programs, we gave ourselves about a month to figure out how we could modify the location on site to make it safe for all of our campers and to make sure that our staff was trained. So come July, we were ready to go. We had small on-site camps and they were so well received and our parents were so pleased and the kids just had such a good time that that really set us up then for this fall to open up our learning pods where we've been able to welcome in students who are learning virtually all of their school uh, material online to come into the museum and use the resources that we have here, including our educators, our Wi-Fi, 
and areas like the science theater and do lab to really help supplement those kids, give them a social experience, yet still continue to keep them safe. My immediate thoughts to the sudden change were kind of alarming, um, but and very surprising. We I got a call from Tracy the weekend that we knew, figured out that we had to close down, and she said, "We've got to close our doors. We have to figure out what to do from here." Um, and then immediately after that, I got a call from Dawn talking about she had this great idea to release um, digital programming because. Our doors were closed, so we couldn't have people coming to the museum anymore. So her and I worked closely together that weekend to kind of pivot what we were doing and utilize things that we already had in place, but we weren't necessarily using, like our YouTube, our Facebook, and our website. So we worked to figure out where we were going to house this content that she wanted to film and release for the community. And um, it was kind of exciting to put all of that together, but it was um, very difficult and kind of a challenge. Marketing all of the content that we were creating or all of the programs that we were doing was mainly a social media effort. Um, we were trying to get the word out in a free way, I guess, um, trying to work within a space where we didn't have much budget to do, I guess, like TV advertising or print advertising. Um, so we relied a lot on social media and word of mouth. So we would brand these programs and these products and release them on our website, get all of the information there where people could go and see where all of this information lives, but really relied heavily on social media to get the word out and our community to share um, these exciting opportunities with their neighbors, with the communities that they're a part of, um, different Facebook pages and things like that. So it was a, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it was really a online team effort and we definitely utilize our social media more than we have in the past. So what I did with social media was um, there was a lot of tracking involved and a lot of getting our social media and our website and everything else that we were releasing on a digital platform to play nice together. So as we were releasing this content that's housed on our website, we're watching the YouTube analytics, we're watching the social media analytics, we're seeing where our audiences come from, what they're interested in, and um, seeing what, because we were releasing videos um, with different content. So we showcased the Zoo One video, or we showcased an experiment that you could do at home. We got our planetarium involved. And so tracking kind of what our audience was engaging with the most was how we sort of evolved our digital content to where we are now and creating just this quality experience for our audience. A um, lot of numbers, the analytics are my favorite. I love um, looking at our website and seeing where people are going, how they're interacting with our content, and then watching our social media numbers, seeing how many people we're reaching, who's engaging with what. Um, it's just really exciting if you like a numbers game like that. And so it was a lot of work and a lot of um, sort of analyzing the data, but I think it worked well and we produced really great stuff because of sort of watching what people were engaging in and how I was labeling uh, our videos and using SEO and using keywords and trying to reach a broad enough audience. Uh, we have a, there's a community in Seattle actually that posts our content day, or well, was daily but now um, weekly because they were so excited that we were releasing free content so that was kind of cool to engage the community all the way in Seattle. Pivoting from one thing to another is, is always challenging and so when we first got started we thought three videos a day, seven days a week, that seems doable. However, after a short amount of time we realized it's doable but not necessarily sustainable if we want to move forward and continue to serve the community in different ways. So one of the things that we had to keep in mind throughout this entire process and we're still doing is how do we make sure that we can be sustainable with everything that we're doing. And so throughout this entire process certainly we did have challenges and we continue to have challenges and We've put a lot of long, long hours into the development and the production of all the things that we've done. 
The one thing I can say is we have an extremely strong and talented team that has made getting past the challenges more doable. So as we got into a more sustainable model for all of our digital content and we realized on-site summer camps probably were not going to happen, we realized we really need to figure out what can we do to make summer fun as, as kids transition into the summer and maybe help out parents a little bit. And so that's where Camp in a Box came into play. And of course the big challenge for us was how do we order enough materials, package materials, and figure out how to ship those materials, not necessarily locally, but throughout the state, out of state, and we even experienced shipping to Great Britain. And so that was something where we realized we needed a little bit of help from an outside source, and so our community partner really helped walk us through all of that, and, and that really helped us get through that challenge as well as gain a lot of new skills. Once we did realize that we could do on-site camps, the big challenge was how do we make everything safe and still fun? When you have to stay distance six feet apart, how do you have fun during summer camps? So again, it was taking a step back, talking as a team, and really figuring out what do we do and how, we, how do we do it? And so we made it work. We also had to engage with our facilities team to see if they could help us out with, with cleaning and sanitizing, as well as other members of the staff to make sure that areas of the building were clean when campers were entering and exiting the beginning of, and the end of the day. Towards the end of summer, as we learned that schools were doing virtual online programming for their day-to-day -day content, and wanting to transition into a learning pod, we realized, well, gee, we're, we're normally a location where schools come to us and we supplement that regular curriculum in 45 minutes to 60 minutes and then they leave. So this was a very different type of challenge for us because this is hosting children between eight and four, making sure that they're doing content, they're logging in, they're following all of their studies, they have Wi-Fi and IT access, and some of these kids are kindergartners. They can't necessarily read. Or some children have never really had a laptop or other device that they've learned from. So part of that is even educating those children on how to use those new tools to make sure that they're keeping up with their studies. Again, taking a step back, assessing where we were, and really relying on the talent that we had on staff. We have people who were formal educators in previous lives, so that's been very helpful. And certainly, we have an entire museum of resources. So during those down times, we're able to supplement the content in a great way. So really, as we've pivoted and overcome a lot of these challenges, we've relied on each other and our skills and our talents and the community to help get through those challenges so that we make sure that we're staying on mission and we're still a valuable resource for our community. So as we started to pivot and adapt to the situation, we did face many challenges. One, of course, was financial. So without any customers coming through our door, um, we did see great reduction in income, including membership income. Um, being closed, some of our members were like, you know, we'd love to support you, but we have our own issues. We saw a reduction from donors because, you know, justifiably so, the donors were switching over to supporting Health and Human Services at that point, and that took funds that we had actually had all teed up but needed to be redirected from the donors to other organizations. Um, and it's tough. So as we looked at that, we're, we knew that we just had to continue our mission. So we exist to support this community through education and access to our collections. And so we were wondering, you know, how do we do that, especially during COVID when we're closed and people can't come to us, we can't physically go to them, so, um, and they may not even have internet. So some of the solutions we came up with for that were actually very creative, and we were able to put together some summer uh, activity pamphlets that we sent out with uh, Dayton Public School students who were picking up their lunches those last, that last week of school, um, working with teachers to help them with some online content and making our online content free for teachers who wanted to access that at that time. So we just did everything we could to still be relevant, serve our community, 
and keep our staff healthy and safe while feeding our animals and everything else that we needed to do. I think the pivoting went well, all things considered. Um, we were all kind of thrown into a world that we didn't necessarily know or live in, uh, now being closed and attempting to be present without actually being present. So it was an excellent team effort between education, myself, and all of the other departments trying to come together and figure out how we could create engaging content and still be relevant. Um, so the team effort was just amazing. Some of the hardships though that we faced in the very beginning was maybe being a little too ambitious with the content we were going to release. Um, we wanted it to be exciting, we wanted it to be engaging, but also um, the reality of releasing all of these videos and learning how much work it takes between the teams and um, coming up with the content, recording the content, it, um, it really kind of took a toll on us in the beginning, I think, but we all rallied together and supported one another and sort of made it through this hardship and there was a learning curve. We learned how to release excellent content on a daily basis um, while still keeping our sanity a little bit. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that we faced and kind of dealt with, but we did it beautifully and uh, realized that the content that we released is more about quality than quantity. When we first started releasing these programs, we were releasing three a day for seven days a week. And it was a very ambitious project that we sort of scaled back to, um, we scaled it back to one a day and now we're releasing one a week just because we've got so many other things going on and we've adjusted really well to this sort of new way of life. Um, we've also kind of wrapped it into our distance learning programs and utilized the things that we already have, which is very successful. Um, I think as we worked together as a team, we were able to kind of showcase all of the things that we do at Boonshoft and Sunwatch and get all of the departments involved that may have not have worked together before because we have the zoo, we have collections, we have the education team and we were all working seamlessly together to create this really quality content and engage our community and it was very successful. And doing that during a time when the world completely stopped um, we shut down, but we kept moving forward. We shut down on a Saturday. We got all of these ideas together. We started filming content on Sunday and we're ready to release it to the, to the world basically on Monday. So we pivoted quickly. We worked together quickly and it was just outstanding to see the amount of teamwork and that we weren't going to let the pandemic stop us regardless of what we were doing. During the pandemic, I have settled on three main goals. The first one, of course, is to keep our community, our guests, and our staff safe and healthy. We are doing everything we can do with extra cleaning, with reduced uh, visitorship, um, just taking care of everything we can to make sure people are safe and healthy. The second one is to continue to meet our mission. We have to remind ourselves of why we're here and what we do for the community. So every day we spend time reviewing, you know, how are we getting educational content out? What are we doing to take care of our collections? And there has been a lot of activity in all of those areas, even though people won't see it until we reopen. Um, and then third, of course, is to lose the least amount of money possible. So at this point, it's not about making money, it's about not losing as much money. Uh, we realize we have reduced guests, we have reduced memberships, we have reduced donors, we have reduced grants. So, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and what we are doing is being efficient and having staff, you know, take on multiple roles and help each other out, um, looking at building ideas and programs that once we come out of COVID will be strong and ready to go and using our time wisely. So I have seen a true sense of urgency with the staff, a lot of teamwork, and I think that will pay off down the road um, with or without however long COVID takes, um, and let's hope it's not too much longer. <laughs> We've continued to do quality educational programming in a variety of new formats. We used to do distance learning, now we can do better distance learning. We have improved technology, including lighting, camera, 
computers to make sure that our content is even better and our instructors look better presenting that content. We've been an award-winning provider for a number of years and with everything that we've learned, we've been able to expand the number of programs that we're able to offer to schools and the general public and the homeschool community based on this, as well as the quality of the content that we are able to provide. Now that our technology is able to go mobile, we can go behind the scenes and explore parts of the museum that typically we weren't necessarily able to include in our digital content. Additionally, we've been able to continue summer camps either virtually through Camp in a Box or on site and still make sure that children are safe and having a positive learning environment, enriching their summer skills and during the school year now with our learning pods, uh, supporting their online virtual learning experiences here at the museum as well. We are moving forward together as a team. We have really learned to be accommodating and learn to embrace opportunities as they've been presented. We've learned that if we try something and it doesn't work, try something else. And really being a science institution, we're kind of used to that process. That's one of the things that we like to teach. We've learned too that really to be successful, and I think a lot of us knew this before, we really have to engage our entire team. We have to take a look at everybody's strengths and encourage everybody to be involved. And I think during this process, a lot more individuals got involved with some of these projects than they would have normally, which has really helped them to embrace the whole process and really feel like they've contributed to something. And that's really, really important, not only to us as team members, but also to the strength of our entire team in the institution. Another thing is to make sure that we're grateful because none of this would have been happening without all of us working together and all of the amazing work that went into this because of the talents of our team. So it's very important to say thank you for all of the time, all of the many hours, and all of the dedication because everybody that works certainly for this institution loves this institution and I think it really shows. And lastly, I think it's extremely important to make sure to listen to your community, especially now. In the last six months, I don't think we would have had all of the successes without our team and the community showing support and letting us know how we're helping and how we might be able to help. So we're all here because we want to serve our communities. So keeping the community front and center is also really vital. I think where we're at now is in a really unique and great spot. We've reopened in a limited capacity, so we have that offered to our community, but we're still releasing digital programs online and virtually once a week. Um, I think in order for a nonprofit to survive in this environment, we do have to utilize our social media and our online presence. Um, so my role kind of kicked in gear during this because we wanted to engage our community through all of our social platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our website, and keep them involved with what we were doing at the Boonshoft. And I think um, the agility that we showed during this pandemic, able to bring teams together to work together, as well as engage our audience through a digital platform, really made us stand out and kept us going during a pandemic. We were able to kind of shine a light on all of the unique things that we do between Boonshoft and Sunwatch with our zoo, education, our collections, things like that, and kind of shine a light on how special we are and how relevant we still can be in a very digital age while still um, practicing and um, really taking our mission to the next level and existing in a digital age when um, that isn't necessarily what museums have done in the past. And I am just really proud of our organization. I'm proud to be a part of it. And working with our social media, I was able to engage our audience, but um, without having much to work with, we had to get creative. So I was using SEO, I was using keywords. Um, I was telling our community to please share our posts, P please um, engage with us, let us know what you wanna see. And that kind of helped our online presence explode with everybody sort of engaging online and 
being present and um, being excited about what we were releasing. And so it was nice to kind of be able to showcase the skills that I could bring to the table um, while highlighting all of the amazing things that we do at the Dayton Society of Natural History. So it was really exciting and for the, us as a nonprofit to survive, we sort of um, utilized the tools that we already had but weren't necessarily using as much as far as website and social media go. And it was neat to be a part of that process. In the current environment, I believe for a nonprofit to survive, you've got to, of course, be looking at cost cutting measures and efficiencies, but also really educating the community on why you exist. Um, we have done both of those things throughout this entire process, and we will continue to do so. And actually, it's been a great experience internally because everyone who works here is a lot more focused on what our mission truly is and why we exist. Um, we even did that with our largest annual fundraiser, BASH. And during that event, we almost didn't have it because it is a fancy sit-down dinner, three, 350 people, uh, a place for people to see each other and you know really get to know each other and experience the museum after hours. To translate all of that virtually would be really difficult. What we did instead is we made a very nice um, sophisticated, kept the mood of bash uh, program, and we told our story. We went bash to basics. So that let us share with our community and our stakeholders what we, what we are, what we do for the community, and we just put it right out there. We showed different segments of all of our main areas with biology, astronomy, uh, STEM education, and history. And then we also had guest appearances from some of the people who have come here as children, as young adults, and had their lives truly formed and shaped by their visit. I think that tells a great story. I think it reminded us of our roots as well. And it gives us a very positive energy going forward. That positive energy, that looking down the road, that vision of what comes next, and not just dwelling on the challenges of today is what's going to take us into the next, you know, 127 years for us um, and keep us going and keep us relevant. I think everybody needs to take some time and pause and think about that and then figure out how you're going to stay positive and implement it with all the swirling everything else we have to worry about. That's never going to go. <laughs> It'll just be replaced by something else. So, you know, keeping that going and keeping staff motivated and engaged, the community engaged, and everybody on that same page is what's going to make it. I will be honest, if Tracy had asked me at the beginning of the year to come up with a Boonshoft at Home series complete with printable and downloadable materials, a virtual camp in a box with materials sent, a learning pod to supplement children on site, I might have thought she was a little bit crazy. However, now really being able to go back and reflect, I think this is a true testament of how talented we all are, how capable we all are of really gathering our thoughts getting down to business and figuring out how to do it. And really looking back, this has been a rewarding experience, I think for me and a lot of other people at the museum because we've really been able to put to the test where our strengths are. And I think that's amazing. And I'm proud of all of us. To say that there have been positives from COVID seems sort of like a contradiction in terms. However, with that staying positive and having a vision for the future, there were some things we were able to get done um, due to COVID and being closed and then opening slowly that we probably wouldn't have gotten to for some time. We were struggling to finish. We were really ramping up to open Sunwatch Village again. It's beautiful. It looks absolutely amazing. So we had money from two different grant sources, the Kettering Family Foundation and the Montgomery County Solid Waste District to do, it was a pretty ambitious project. So we were putting down new pathwork, new signage, and really freshening up that entire village. And uh, it was going to be ready for opening, but it was going to be tight. 
So after we closed, we were able to put actually more thoughtfulness into that and slow down a little bit, and, and it looks amazing. It looks beautiful. The uh, new exhibits that we had just opened in March will still be beautiful, and they are beautiful today, so we didn't lose anything there. And the uh, collections team was actually able to put things out onto the floor as we rerouted to do one-way traffic, something I thought would be impossible. Clearly it's not, they figured it out, and we have more objects out on display now than ever in the past. Um, we have been able to clean and deep clean and really look and fix uh, some things that needed fixing. So it gave our facilities and maintenance teams time to dig into some stuff that they had wanted to do, but it's always going to be next week or you just can't do it while you have visitors in the building. So we have dusted from the rafters to the floor. There is no dust, there is no grime, there is no leftover anything. We have cleaned out closets, we have gotten rid of papers. We have just taken a really um, deep dive into everybody's spaces and everything that we do to say, what do we, what do we need this for? What, why are we keeping this? Why are we stepping around this? Let's make sure that we're meeting all of our codes and you know everything is truly safe for our visitor as they come back. And I think as they do come back, and they are coming back, they, they see that, and we've gotten quite a few compliments about you know, how clean the place is, um, how they like the uh, not being run over by hordes of people and enjoying it while it is kind of a quiet time, and being able to see these extra exhibits. Uh, Sunwatch Village has had a million um, compliments on how it looks, and actually the numbers at Sunwatch are already back up to almost normal, being an outdoor place where people can come there safely and be distanced. So we are able to showcase many of our talents and creativity amongst the staff and the things that they're able to do. Even you know, as we do things like this, the technology behind it and the talent behind it to make it all happen was something that was kind of there and being used, but not really a showcase piece. And you know, everybody has, has really stepped up. And so I have seen tremendous growth across our team. I have seen people working together who didn't in the past, uh, less silos, if you will. And I think all of that will be important to remember as we continue to go forward um, of maybe how we would like to continue in what will someday be our new normal. Um, and just to uh, remember the lessons we've learned and share that with others. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the first virtual Take 5 Nonprofit Leadership Conference. We're now going to move into the Q&A session with our panelists from Boone Shop Museum of Discovery. Please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. And I see we have a few questions already. Uh, what aspects of your program revisions do you think will become permanent? So this is Dawn. Hi, everybody. So certainly we have had a very robust distance learning program prior to COVID and uh, since COVID that has continued to increase. It's one of the things that we've really realized is distance learning is, is not going anywhere. This is going to be something that continues and we had over the last few years started to see an increase in the demand. Um, but certainly now as we move forward with developing online content or in-person content, that will most likely happen together. So in the past, rather than developing programming specifically for distance learning audiences or content specifically for on-site, we'll be developing those programs together. So it's very easy and very quick to adapt any of the content that we develop to move forward. So that really gives us a lot of flexibility in how we are able to provide programming for uh, the community both here and anywhere. All right, our next question. You mentioned, mentioned engaging with people in Seattle. Do you think this expands your market? Um, I do think it expands our market a little bit. Um, we were working to engage our community and we kind of saw all of our digital analytic numbers go up by like 300% when we first started pushing this content. 
and it really did expand our audience. And we, um, we introduced some scout programs as well during this um, pandemic. And we had people from all over the country, a few from Puerto Rico. I think Don can speak a little bit better to where some of these people came from, but we've, we saw people in these programs from all over the place that are not from the immediate area. So it was really cool to kind of see our name out there in 20 some odd states now and then looking at our um, analytics and on the back end i can see where people are coming from and they're all over the world and it's absolutely incredible to see kind of how our audience exploded during this um, so i do think it did ex it expanded our market and now that we are moving into more like digital learning programs with dawn we can reach people that aren't just necessarily our immediate community even though that's who we want to serve but we can serve communities that are outside the state as well which is pretty cool Looking back on the response, do you think your team had all the skills needed to operate in the new environment? And if not, what was missing and how did you overcome that? All right, I'll take that one. So I think that um, the biggest skill that we had, and it's just something that is in our day-to-day -day culture of the museum and in both locations, is problem solving. And so when you have people who know how to learn and who don't mind self-teaching um, and figuring things out, we have said multiple times that we may not know what we don't know, but we know how to find an answer to it. So they have been very good at YouTube videos and researching and finding books and information and talking to other people, asking for help, working with mentors, whatever it takes to be able to learn the thing. So we call it all the things. We do all the things all the time. And um, I think some of the things that made us strong through this, and you heard Don and Taylor and I all mention team and positivity. So just being able to work with each other, having a willingness to make mistakes and being okay with people around you making mistakes because they're trying hard to do new things really quickly was very critical. Um, if we hadn't been open to that type of, you know, testing type of environment, Don referenced, you know, the scientific method of you try it, and if it doesn't work, you do something different. Um, it would have made it really hard, I think, for people to feel comfortable leaning that far forward and knowing that they could mess up and get into trouble for it or let people down. Instead, we, we really helped each other and, and allowed people to make those mistakes and also to shine. So as you worked in teams, you know, not everyone can be the superstar, but it takes everyone to make it happen. And uh, I think just reaching out and recognizing the people who helped, the people who were front and center, but had a lot of staff behind them, um, creativity and all of the ideas and that cross training part with the different departments working together. We have been working on that for a very long time. And this just brought it all home as to why it's so important. So we were very fortunate because the distance learning program, we didn't decide to do distance learning because of COVID. It was already well in process. And so it just ramped it up even faster and brought it you know, even more important to what we were doing. The equipment that was being used to record the videos was brought in for distance learning. So we didn't have to run out and go find those things. We just had to learn to use them better and our team did. So we have two people, Mackenzie and Vicki, who are you know, behind the cameras right now, um, who make all of these happen and help test everything. And you know, they will say, we didn't know we were gonna be in video production. Like they are in education. We hired Vicki to do curriculum, but she's now our you know, production assistant with Mackenzie and doing all of the sorting out who's gonna sit where and what's the background look like. And you know, so I think just, Having staff that is um, open to suggestions, open to flexibility, and willing to help each other out, and that culture, they can tell you you need a strong vision and mission, but without culture, you're not going anywhere, and that is something we've worked very hard on. So I do think we had the skills we needed, even though we didn't know what the skills would be, if that makes sense. <laughs> do you think this new way of operating opens up other sources of funding? I think um, it's a challenge for us because people really want to come here. They want to be on site. They want to have their hands on things. And so we have worked more and more 
to have toe touch areas, low touch areas, and be able to clean faster to do that once an hour cleaning process. Um, we had already looked at different revenue streams, and with this, we've had to shift that focus. So, you know, Taylor is working right now on getting, uh, you know, online sales up for some of our gift shop items. That's something that we have, again, considered in the past, but it's never really been that urgent of a need. Now it is. Uh, with Dawn and the education team, they've put a lot more content online. We made that free for educators, but of course, at some point, we will have to get paid for our services. So, you know, some of that content hopefully gives people a taste of what we can do, and then they will want to buy into more robust programming that we can deliver. Our um, exhibits team has been working on creating uh, traveling exhibits. That's going to get back burnered for a while because other museums are in the same state we are and don't have funding for that but it does bring our exhibits team with being able to do our replicas and things based on our collections. That's where Taylor will focus more of that online sales to really both promote our mission and we're able to create our own products and, and be able to capture as much of that revenue as possible to support our, our um, operations. You mentioned having to cancel one of your biggest fundraising events of the year during the beginning of the stay at home order. Have you thought of any new fundraising events or other ways to supplement what you would have raised at the Eureka event? I think Dawn and I both have very strong opinions on this one. We, um, we did cancel Eureka. We didn't lose as much funding as you might think because many of the ticket holders, actually all but just a few, and the sponsors allowed us to keep their, um, their donation, their ticket price that they had paid in. And then for our bash event, we actually were able to net more this year with our virtual event than we did last year with our in-person event. So I think, you know, keeping those, really those events focused on they are for fundraising, they are for operations, and I think that people who participate for the most part understand that. We are also looking at doing smaller events and a series of those events that again would be focused on our mission, um, but keep people safe and um, socially distanced from each other. So Dawn is putting that together now. We should be rolling out the first one, we think in December and then have a series for next year once we get some of the kinks worked out of that and we're calling it, are we allowed to say what we're calling it yet, Dawn? I, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> Taylor, what do you think? <laughs> I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> right, so I'd say yes. yes we're calling yes. it date night and it'll be, you know, sort of a upscale experience with food and wine pairings and um, content from around the world and historical, uh, cultural content, which we can also bring zoo animals in, et cetera. So it just brings all of our different departments together to showcase what we can do. Did you change your social media strategy at all or to, to try to get people to engage more with your posts? And what did that look like? Yes, I think there was kind of a big strategy, strategy shift um, with this now that we when we introduced the Boonshaft at Home digital programming, we actually had scheduled posts. So we kind of created our own um, schedule and the way we were gonna push this content. So that was kind of a big change from previously where it was just kind of like, well, we'll throw stuff out there and see if it works. But now we had to kind of stick to a schedule, stick to a script, and then kind of be mindful and balance the Boonshaft at Home with different promotional posts, different fun fact posts from the zoo and things like that. So it took a lot more thought and a lot more um, strategy to how um, we were gonna lay that out, how we were gonna balance all of the things that we were doing um, to make it engaging and not just kind of like the hard sell, I guess. Um, it was a really interesting and fun thing to do, but it, it was definitely a huge mind shift and there was a lot of strategy involved with how we get our online community to engage with us as well. We had to think about what nuggets we were going to put in our videos to say, hey, tell us more about um, how you did this experiment at home or tell us what your favorite part was to kind of get people plugged in and engaged and so kind of 
shifting everyone's mindset, like the educators to be like, okay, we have to put the little nuggets in these videos now, like, hey, comment below, let us know what you want to think. And um, it was a little bit of a challenge, but it was really fun to do. So yes, there was a huge strategy shift. I don't, Don can maybe speak to some of that as well, but I enjoyed it very much. <laughs> The special needs community is one hit especially hard with COVID closures and changes. As a nonprofit farmstead community for the differently abled farmers of Spring Valley Township, would Boonshoff be open to a collaborative experience for small groups at our farm among goats, chickens, rabbits, and nature? We're definitely opening, open to partnering with different organizations around the community. Um, I would say we should probably talk more uh, about what that encompasses, um, what type of time commitment it involves on both ends. And certainly as, as all organizations, that's one of the things that we always take into account for anything that we take on. But I would say, please reach out to me and we will talk more. Um, we are right now working on some programming and opportunities um for children with special needs right now so i think this is something that we could definitely have more conversation about what types of questions did you ask yourselves to really align yourselves for your new mission and goals all right i'll take that one so we have been uh like i said we just finished a strategic planning uh last year through aileron and we meet monthly on that as a team of seven people to really look at each piece of that and what we're doing. So as we went into the COVID situation, we kind of put that on hold for a little bit, but then we realized pretty quickly that it, it really is all about maintaining, you know, reaching those goals and why we exist and what we're doing. So the types of questions we asked, one of them that I really love was, um, if we can't go, if people can't come in our doors and we can't go to them, how do we continue our mission? They may not have internet, they may not have a, you know, a smartphone even. And so we really have had to dig deep to say, how do we get our message out, share our educational opportunities? Um, Don has just put together a method of doing a program on base through the USO, which of course the base is closed to anyone coming in. So it's like, then how are we going to do that? So we have a sponsor who is sponsoring us to do content with um, military families on base. And we could have just shrugged our shoulders and said, well, we just can't do it. Sorry. But instead, you know, Don came up with a system working with the USO folks. And uh, that's coming up. We'll do that program on October 24th. And, you know, it's, it's turning out it's going to be actually very fun and they'll be launching pumpkins. Um, so. There's things that you can do. You just have to remember what you said you were going to do and then look at it through this whole different lens of, okay, so using video, using technology on our end, using low technology aspects, using a combination of all of these things, how can we do that? And Dawn and her team are working more now on outdoor programming and um, you know we're doing the pods. So there's been a lot of shifting but not shifting to say, now we're into you know, used car sales. Like that's not our mission and we're not going there. So just every idea that comes up may not be the best fit idea for what we can do. So we spend a lot of time sharing ideas and then figuring out what can we do, what meets our mission, what, um, as I said in the, you know, earlier, what loses the least amount of money and we can do as economically as possible, but have the most uh, impact with that. How did you research the type of keywords or SEO to leverage what you talked about? What were some of the strategy you used on social media to utilize them? Um, I did a lot of Googling, to be completely honest with you, um, looking at other institutions who were similar to us and what they were doing, what they were pushing. Um, Google Analytics has a really neat feature where it will let you set your um, SEO in your keywords to see what is working and, and what is not um, based on the web pages that people are, are visiting. Um, so I kind of tried to pull some of that content into our social media strategy. So if we were um, using like um, AZA accredited zoo or 
something else that was very specific and niche like that, see how that affected our numbers on our website and then translate that into social media and how I word our posts um, very specifically to get traction there and on our website since that we were kind of trying to make them play together. So it was some trial and error at the beginning, um, but I think I finally found our stride with what we're doing and how we're pushing that content. And so they play really well together, but it is a lot of like uh, the scientific method, trial and error, you figure out what works and what doesn't. And you just look at your analytics, you look at your numbers and you do a lot of Googling and see what other nonprofits who are similar to you are using and doing and how you can play on their audiences as well. As you look to the future, have you considered providing virtual tours of your facility? I would say if you look through the 80 plus videos that we have created, um, each one of those highlights a part of our facility. So as you think about a virtual tour, um, people come here for a variety of reasons. A virtual tour of hands-on activity for a child is not gonna quite be the same. Um, I don't know, I say that and then I think, oh, Vicki's hearing this and she's gonna come up with a video where there'll be experiencing the water table on video. So I, I, he I hesitate to say that's impossible. Um, but we, we have had, uh, you know, Jill, our curator, do um, presentations from things that aren't even on exhibit. So you can actually take tours back through the vaults and, and investigate items in the collections that way. The zoo team has done a great job with highlighting animals in the zoo and animal behavior. And then of course, Dawn's team has broadcast a lot of information from both the, the science theater where she's sitting now and the do lab um, and outside and you know all over. And then over at Sunwatch, we've had live broadcast and recorded video from over there. So I think that we have done that um, without saying, why don't you just tuck in for about two hours and we'll take a full tour. Um, so we're just trying to balance that out and let people see the areas that they're interested in the most. How did you ensure the social distancing at your Sunwatch Village? And did you have any outdoor sanitizing methods you used for the individual participants in your outdoor facilities? We, um, we've got signs posted that encourage um, social distancing and we do require masks while we are inside, but um, I do take a lot of walks and we do have a couple staff that kind of make sure to reinforce that if you do see other groups out in our village, please help us practice safe social distancing. You can see out behind me, this is our village and we do have a lot of space. Um, we do have pretty great foot traffic numbers, but it's, they aren't, we aren't as crowded that we can't kind of control where people are and what they are doing. And we also have sanitizing stations placed throughout as well for people to utilize. Um, we're trying to be as safe as possible and follow the rules and um, just encourage people to be mindful and be safe while they are here and outside in the village. Knowing the challenges impacting education, have you considered providing your courses and other resources to educational systems across the country for a fee to supplement the loss of upper operating revenue? Yeah, actually, that's one of the things that we've been investigating prior to COVID. So um, Tracy mentioned Vicki, who's actually helps with virtual programming, but she is our curriculum specialist. And that was one of the reasons that she was brought on board was to help develop content that we could potentially uh, sell at a, at a fee um, anywhere throughout the state of Ohio and across the country. And so we were actually in a piloting uh, process right before COVID hit. So we do have a number of teachers that work with us. Um, and part of their goal was to pilot some of this developed content with the ultimate goal to be able to provide that resource. Uh, we also have a presence on a website called Teachers Pay Teachers, uh, which essentially provides some content for free and some content for a fee. Um, so you, you may find things there for as little as a dollar for an activity, um, upwards of a few hundred dollars for a full curriculum package uh, developed by a number of educators or educational institutions like us. So that is certainly something that we have uh, continued to explore. And right now, we're, as we go into the fall, we are working on uh, basically a, a method of how do we talk to schools and other organizations to start this process again 
Of course, how you talk to schools is a little bit different now, and we're very aware of that, um, but we are definitely working on that. What was the percent decrease in your programs and overall budget? So we lost, um, we're running about 10 to 25% uh, revenues right now for, um, if you look at ticket sales um, through guest services, gift shop sales, memberships, um, our donations, as I said before, have gone down. We do still have donors. We are applying for a lot of different grants and different things. Um, and all of the different COVID funding, of course, but yes, we're running, we, our normal budget is about four and a half million and we have been able to cut our expenses down by almost a million. Um, and that's been over two years. That's not just been since COVID. There was already things in process that helped trim some of that out. Um, and then we are, you know, just trying to, we have not filled empty positions. Um, and we have uh, tried to keep as much of our staff as possible, but we have cut some part-time hours, um, some expenses that could be deferred, we've deferred. So our, I think I, yeah, I think I got everything. <laughs> Overall budget's about four and a half million. We're running about a million short this year on that. And we're currently losing about 200 to 250,000 a month in revenue that we would normally have coming in through those memberships, ticket sales, and gift shop purchases, and school programs with school field trips as well. Did you have to lay off staff? Are you financially healthy? And if so, how are you staying financially healthy? And where is most of your funding coming from right now? We have only laid off and cut just a few positions. Um, so like I said, we, we did have some people who went on to other jobs and we did not backfill those. We had people wearing many hats. We had a joke that Taylor should be, you know, with a bunch of hats all piled up on her head because like she's now leading marketing and Sunwatch Village. There used to be a different person who led marketing, but we were able to eliminate that position and then Taylor was able to take that on. So that's, you know, she's just one example of that. There are about 10 people in that situation right now across our staff. We have a staff of about 53. Um, if we were fully staffed, we should be closer to maybe 70, 75. So we're, we're down um, and we'll hunker down and stay that way in the survival mode here for a while. I will, I will say though, we are getting a lot done. So I am terribly proud of how much we are still able to do for the visitor experience and for educational and um, collections activities with the short staff. Um, staying financially healthy and where's our funding coming from now? We are uh, looking toward hopefully getting, you know, some of the COVID money that's coming in to help small businesses and nonprofits and arts and cultural institutions. It is tough because there's just not enough to really fill the gaps for everyone. We are asking donors to um, consider us as soon as they are able. But right now that's also kind of a tough ask. And we are fortunate because we do have um, some endowment funding. And so that is what you know a good endowment is for, is to be able to lean on in the hard times. So we will be looking there to help fill some of that gap as well. How do you keep your staff positive and motivated about your mission? Um, I, I will answer that, but I'd also like to hear from Don and Taylor on that one. So, um, you know, we, we each have groups that we work with every day. And one of the things that I just like to say is allow people to be people and we are all allowed to have a bad day. You just can't have a bad day every day and expect to come in and lay that on everybody else every day. It's too much. And so we try to take time to visit and listen and understand people have a lot going on at work, at home, in their family, in their friends, you know, canceled trips, canceled everything, school, children at home. There's a lot happening. So like have some patience and have some understanding. But while at work, be at work and, you know, allow yourself to put all of that sort of compartmentalize it and focus on your job and look at the achievements of yourself and those around you. 
So we try to celebrate our victories and console each other as needed. And then, you know, when people are really down is just kind of listen to them and then help them get out of it. Because we have had some people who got really stuck and paralyzed by COVID and it makes it tough for the rest of the team to be able to keep that leaning forward. You, you can hear, I think from all of us, there's a true passion about what we, we, what we do. And there's a reason we come to work every day or you know, even if that's from a home office. Um, and you just have to be able to get through that and move forward. And some days that seems harder than others. But uh, Dawn, do you have anything you would add to that? Yeah, I've got a few things. So first off, um, snacks and treats <laughs> are always <laughs> beneficial. So ice cream is a big thing <laughs> on, my, on my side. But you know, I think, I think the spring was certainly the hardest when we didn't have people coming through. And so, like Tracy said, a lot of people kind of got into a funk and we, we all kind of did. And once we were able to open again, I think um, certainly from an educational perspective, just being able to see that those small amounts of joy as people came through the door or interacted with our educators or, you know, Taylor, I think too, when, when folks came back to Sunwatch, even though our, our numbers are decreased, I think we really have all focused on just the sheer excitement for people to be back and just being in some place different. Um, and that for us is motivational. So I think for, for us, when we're all having a bad day, again, being able to go back onto the museum floor and hear just the sheer joy that people have with learning and and seeing new things and even seeing other people from a distance it's those small things that make all of this worthwhile and um you know i i think i mentioned gratitude earlier too just the gratitude of being able to do that for people and finding a way to do that and so focusing on those those positives i think really gets all of us through the day when we have those days where it's a little bit difficult, but I think remembering why we're here, and I think that's certainly what um, a lot of my team members do. We just kind of sit and we realize we are providing a wonderful service and we love that. And I think um, remembering why we're here helps quite a bit. I like that. I think that translates well, that being grateful for the things that we do have and kind of this to echo Tracy, the, the culture that we're, we've created here, that we understand that we're all human, and we're all going through this together and we're all, every, everybody's gonna have a bad day, but understanding that we are human and that you can turn to your coworkers too to help you through this because we're all going through it together. Um, we do all have our separate experiences, but this is one thing that we can talk to about with each other and then just being able to, cause I'm off site technically, but being able to come over to the museum and see everybody and everybody seems excited to see me and I'm excited to see them. And so we've kind of created this sort of family atmosphere in a way, just because we are going through the muck together. And so I think that is count your blessings, be grateful that we are still here and get to do these things and provide these services for people in the community. So it's been really great. There's one other thing I would add to that. Um, Taylor, you mentioned family and I think that's a big part. Like we, we understand, um, you need people who are managers who make decisions and not, you know, not everyone's going to get agreed with. And some days that's hard, you know, especially when you see somebody having a bad day and you have to also counsel them on something else. And it's like, wow, I just really like to give you a lot of space, but we also have to work. Um, but one thing we did while, as we've opened back up is our um, exhibits team pulled out all of these great panel text pieces from old exhibits that have come through that were built within the museum and they put them up in the staff hallway and then at one end of the hallway we put up our mission mission and vision statement and then we've got pictures of all of our staff and put those in like little frames five by sevens or eight by tens and it's them being human it's them with their cat or with their dog or at a you know a concert or out in the woods, you know, hiking or something like that. And, uh, and I think that, you know, it's, it's kind of helps remind us that we do find our staff very important and we really want to know them and include them. So just sprucing up the area, that back 
staff hallway just looked like, a, you know, like an abandoned space. And now it's really inviting and it looks like part of the museum. Um, and I think it should be because I think staff areas should be equally as important as your front facing areas, but oftentimes they get left behind or ignored or fall into disarray. So we've just taken more time to give ourselves a little more professionalism, cleaning up spaces, cleaning out offices, and also cleaning up those open spaces that the staff all uses, um, which I think lifts everybody's spirits too. And I think we have one last question. Okay. Do, you, do you have a board of directors and did you have to redo your budget and have it approved before moving forward? We do have a board of directors. We have a board of trustees and they have been very engaged as, and supportive throughout this entire process. Um, we did not redo our current budget for 2020. Um, we have made adjustments and stayed in conversations about that as we have gone. And we are very hopeful that uh, if things come together as we hope they should, we should still finish the year not too far off of what we had kind of predicted for this year. We had, as I said earlier, we started out the year super strong. And so we would have really beat that budget this year, but this year now, <laughs> that seems like, you know, that seems like a very long time ago. Um, so our budget was very conservative and, uh, and now we're living up to that. Um, we're proposing our budgets for next year. We actually put together five different versions, everything from what I call the bloody budget, which is like, what if we had to close back down and we were closed for the entire year, um, to a you know good, better, best, amazing budget, which would be what if we were operating as normal next year. Obviously, it's gonna be somewhere between those two, so we've just been running a lot of numbers and trying to get the best um, forecast of budget as possible that seems reasonable maybe a little more on the aggressive side, but not too aggressive, and uh, keeps as much of our team as possible so we can keep producing these programs and meeting our mission. If we cut too much staff, we actually end up self-closing, and that's not where we wanna go. Well, I think that wraps up our Q&A session. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Be sure to register for the next two sessions. It's on you leadership responsibility and supporting a diverse and equitable organizational culture with Ollie Moore of X Factor Solutions on October 14th. And so you had to cancel your fundraising event. Now what? With Nicole Sturk of Sixit on October 20th. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.